The peace of Christ be with you and also with you. join me in our call to worship. We are the people of God, marked by water, claimed by the Spirit, and precious in God's sight. We are the body of Christ, baptized into grace and reborn in mercy. Let us worship God, the giver and renewer of life. God, you are our dwelling place, and so we come before you now in prayer and thanksgiving. In your mercy, you came to share and redeem our humanity. In your baptism, you fulfilled all righteousness. In your death and resurrection, you raised us to new life. In humble adoration, we give you all praise and glory now and forever. Amen. If we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sin and cleanse us of all our unrighteousness. So trusting in the steadfast love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord, let us first pray silently and then join together to pray the unison prayer of, thanks, of confession that's in the bulletin. Thank you. 
Let us pray. Merciful God, in baptism you promise forgiveness and new life, making us part of the body of Christ. We confess that we remain preoccupied with ourselves and separated from our sisters and brothers. We cling to destructive habits, hold grudges, and show reluctance to welcome one another. We allow the past to hold us hostage. In your loving kindness, have mercy on us and free us from sin. Remind us of the promises you made in baptism so that we may rise to new life and live together in grace. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Rejoice and be glad. Blessed are those who seek the face of God. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and made new. Hi, boys and girls. I've shared my baptism story before, but for those of you who may not have heard it or don't remember it, I'll share it again. I grew up in a Christian household with parents who instilled in me a love and passion for serving God. So when I was nine years old, I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And three days before my 10th birthday, my dad baptized me in our church. You see, baptism is a symbol of laying down our life of sinful ways and raising to new life in Jesus Christ, where we actively seek to live and love like he did. And baptism is an act of obedience. God asks this of us after we become Christ followers. Even Jesus was baptized, not because he sinned, but because he was being obedient to God. Many of you have been baptized, either as a baby or a child or a teenager, and that's wonderful. And if you haven't been baptized yet, definitely talk to Pastor Jean or me about this because we would love to help you become baptized and continue serving the Lord. So no matter what, as we walk through life, continue to be faithful and obedient to God, and you will see him do great things through you. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for baptism and the opportunity to know you and be obedient to you. Help us continue to walk in faith every day. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 3. Listen to the word of our Lord. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Then the people of Jerusalem and all Judea were going out to him and all the region along the Jordan, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son, the beloved with whom I am well pleased. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For Lord, you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. In the 1994 animated movie, The Lion King, the opening scene is a baptism. 
all of the animals and birds are traveling from throughout the savanna as they go some distance to arrive at Pride Rock. At the ceremonial ground, the attention of all the animals is fixed on Mufasa, the king of the Pride Lands, and Rafiki, the money, the monkey, serves in the capacity of a minister. He anoints Simba, the son of Mufasa, and presents him to the gathered animals. It's a beautifully animated scene with an amazing soundtrack as young Simba is baptized and held high for all to see. Quite an occasion, but it's nothing compared to the baptism of Jesus. When Jesus is baptized, the heavens open and the spirit of God descends upon him like a dove. He alights on him and a voice comes from the heavens. This is my son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Now, my baptism wasn't quite like that. And I have a hunch yours wasn't either. I did get to wear a long white dress, but there was no processional, no soundtrack, no voice coming from the heavens. In fact, in the Protestant faith, the act of baptism is deceptively simple. In a sense, it's a commissioning service. It's to prepare us for what lies ahead as we are engrafted into this body of Christ together with other Christians who have a stake in our spiritual future. And when the water is placed on our forehead, it's a mark of the Spirit of God descending on us just as it did on Jesus. But why water? Why something as commonplace as that for such a momentous and life-changing event? Well, of course, Jesus often used the ordinary to communicate the extraordinary to us. Common things like water, bread, and wine were used to reveal God to us. And in this case, the water from the Jordan River was used to change lives, to turn people around, to help them change direction from one way of living to another. When folks heard about John the Baptist preaching at the Jordan, they flocked to him. They were looking for a prophet, for someone to come and show them a new way of being able to get by and make their way in the world. And throngs of people came to be baptized by him because they wanted something new. They weren't satisfied with the lives they were leading. They knew that there had to be more to life than the daily grind to which they were accustomed. More than the scarred and broken relationships that they observed around them, more than the oppressed social systems. And they wanted to reinvent their lives so that they could find deeper meaning in it. They wanted to draw closer to God and each other, but they didn't know how to do it. Repent, John said, and his message was compelling. For the first time in their lives, they had hope, hope that the world that they knew would change, hope that the corrupt religious and political systems would be upended, hope that the messianic prophecies would soon be fulfilled, and they wanted in on it. But what about Jesus? What did he hope as he asked his cousin John to submerge him in the muddy river of the Jordan? The truth is we don't know, but we do know that for whatever reason, he decided to walk into the river and let his cousin push him under the water and pull him back up, washed, baptized, marked by the Holy Spirit, given a new identity. And in that act, he didn't claim power for himself. He didn't push John aside and say, I'm going to do the baptisms from now on. Instead, he gave his power away and allowed John to baptize him in the Jordan alongside everyone else from every walk of life. As far as we know, none of the 12 disciples were there with him that day. But afterwards, he told them about his baptism, how it all began, how the sky opened and the spirit of God descended like a dove. And he heard a voice calling and saying, you are my son, my beloved, with you I am well pleased. We can miss it, but those words are rich with meaning. My son, 
My beloved is from the second psalm. It's a coronation psalm used to proclaim someone king. And the second part, with you I am well pleased, comes right from the prophet Isaiah, when he prophesies about the suffering servant, the chosen one who will come to redeem the world by sacrificing himself. Put the two together, and you have the new identity of Jesus, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and the suffering servant who would become the Messiah, the Savior of the world. You can imagine John thinking to himself, but you're the one. Why do you need to be baptized at all? Because like us, when we are baptized, Jesus was being commissioned to a new way of life and a new vocation. He was no longer just a carpenter, no longer just Mary and Joseph's son, but he was now the son of God and called to this new commission for the next three years. He enters the water and knows his old way of life has died, and he rises from the water with a new identity, a new calling as our Savior and Lord. As I have journeyed in my own walk of faith, this whole concept of dying and rising again has held increasing significance for me, because I believe that growth emerges out of pain and loss and death. It might be a physical death that we have experienced, somebody we love, and that causes us somehow to move forward in a new way. But it could also be the loss of a part of our identity. Maybe we stayed home to raise children, or maybe we've recently retired, and we're used to being known for what we do, and suddenly we're known for who we are. It can be rather jolting. But growth won't happen if we remain stagnant. It can only happen if we're willing to transform our thoughts, our actions, our minds, and even our bodies. And the same holds true for our faith. Think about it. To rise to new life, a plant must first die. The flowers fade, the leaves wilt, the bulb lies dormant for the winter. But then the sun warms the earth and the bulb underneath it and the nutrients fuel the new growth and a new season of life is emerges from the ground for us all to see if you find yourself repeating destructive or life draining patterns of the past there's only one way to change it to bury old habits only then can we rise to a new way of being only by listening to where and how God is calling us to stretch ourselves, to take risks, to do things differently, can new growth happen. Dr. Fred Craddock tells the story of a man named Frank. He was a member of his congregation when he was serving a church in a rural area. Frank was a hard-nosed rancher. And he made no bones about it. He wasn't about to come to church, nor did he want to be baptized. And any minister who asked him about it, he told to mind his own business and leave him alone. So everyone was quite surprised when at the age of 77, Frank asked to be baptized. When he was asked, Fred asked him, why now? Why all of a sudden do you want to be baptized now? And Frank said to him, because before I thought my identity was all wrapped up in my role as a rancher. But now I know that's not true. I'm also called to help my neighbor. I'm also called to be your servant, to be God's servant. I can't do that on my own. I need God's help. I need to be baptized. And so Fred baptized Frank. He raised his hand and said in the presence of the congregation, upon your confession of faith in Jesus Christ and in obedience to him, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now don't ever forget it. 
he said. Don't ever forget that who you are is who God called you to be, a child of God, marked as God's own forever. In a recent book, The Gift of Years, Joan Chittister observes that we live in a society in which people routinely ask us what we do immediately after asking our name. Our identity is tied to and dependent on what we do for a living, it seems. So she said, unemployment for whatever cause is not just a financial crisis, but it's an emotional one. It's an identity crisis as well. Who are you when you are not doing what you're supposed to do? Reflecting on her own retirement, she says, I found myself stripped of all of the accessories of life. I had to come face to face with myself. And the fear was that there wasn't a self left. I've spent my life being somebody important and now there's nothing left but me. I no longer run anything. I'm not becoming anything. I'm just me. And it's precisely at that moment, she says, which comes to all of us sooner or later for whatever reason, that we need a life-giving word. You are my child, my beloved. That is your identity. Don't ever forget it. Later in the movie, The Lion King, Simba runs away because he's deceived into believing that he's the one who is responsible for his father's death. And he lives a life that's far removed from the life that he was intended to live as the son of the king and as the rightful heir to the throne. Rafiki, the one who baptized him at the beginning of the movie, finds Simba and attempts to convince him to come back home. He leads Simba to a pool of water, tells him to look into it, and at first, Simba just sees his own reflection. But Rafiki tells him to look more deeply, to look harder. When he does, Simba begins to see his reflection transform into the reflection of his father. And Rafiki says, you see, he lives in you. That's what God's spirit declares to us when we are baptized. Now Jesus lives in us. We can see his reflection in us if we look hard enough. Others can see that reflection too if we own our identity and live into it. And the more we take on Christ's identity, the clearer that reflection becomes. As Simba sees his father's reflection, he hears his father's voice say to him, you have forgotten who you are, and so you have forgotten me. Look inside yourself, Simba. You're more than what you have become. Remember who you are. So hear those words this morning. Wherever you are on your journey of faith, whatever's happening or not happening in your life, whether you're facing surgery or grieving a loss or worried about your job or wondering if you're doing the right thing or simply wondering who you really are. Hear those words from God, those life-giving words. Fear not. I have called you by name. You are mine. You are my beloved, my child, marked as God's own forever. That is our identity. May we never forget it. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, thanks be to God. Amen. Oh, for soul.
Let us lift our hearts up to God in prayer. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. God of heaven and earth, we seek you with all of our being. We're still reeling from the events of this past week and how quickly anger and hatred can fuel division and endanger life. And yet we know that you are the Lord of history, the Lord of all life and all people, and we can rest our hope and confidence in your abiding presence and will for the world you have created. May those of both sides of our political divide join forces and work together to form that more perfect union you envision for us and strive to establish justice and tranquility for all. May we trust that you and you alone can secure the blessings of liberty and do what we can do to promote peace and unity and love. For we know that none of us is more deserving of the grace and mercy you offer all of your children. Sharpen our senses, O God, so that we might see with your eyes, feel with your compassion, and act with your wisdom. Make yourself known to us, O God, in worship, in music, in prayer, in scripture, in our brothers and sisters, in our grief and despair, in our hope and our joys, not once for all time, but each and every day. Though you have spent your love on us, we know that you are not spent. And so pour yourself into our lives and let us have eyes to see and ears to hear. Especially this day, O oh God, we lift up to you the concerns of our hearts, concerns for our nation's leadership, our country, and our world. Those who are victims of prejudice and oppression, those who are struggling with COVID and other illnesses, those who are struggling to repair broken bodies and spirits, those who are reeling from new diagnoses or torn by grief or loss, and those whose names we lift up to you now in the silence of our hearts. Oh Lord, pour your life-giving spirit through each one of us and those we have named and those we haven't named. Fill them with your peace, your strength, your mercy and grace in the days ahead. Through the power of your Holy Spirit, soften the fear and the hatred into reconciliation and forgiveness and bring peace where there is hostility and unity where there is discord. Help us to place our trust in you alone as the Lord of our lives. Lord, you are our lifeline, so help each of us make you the Lord of our life. For we pray all of these things in the name of the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now go with our Lord's benediction. May the blessing and mercy and love of God, our creator, Jesus Christ, our redeemer, and the Holy Spirit, our sustainer, be with you all this day and forevermore.
Amen.